Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Welcome once again to Whitefields Community Church. So glad that you're with us this morning to worship and study God's Word. Hey, middle schoolers, you are staying in with us this Sunday. It's fifth Sunday, and so that's part of our uh, you know, plan for middle schoolers, kind of teach you guys to be in service with us and be part of uh, the church body is that every fifth Sunday, which happens four times a year, you guys hang out with us and uh, study with us in here. So we're glad to have you with us. Would you all please open with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So that's Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians chapter 3. It's in your New Testament, kind of towards the middle of the New Testament, middle back of the New Testament. Feel free to use that table of contents that God has given you to help you navigate your Bible. If you have any trouble finding that, if you use your your phone to read the Bible, we encourage you, use the YouVersion Bible app. Um, because if you go in there, you got all the notes that are on the screen and some more stuff that you can uh, use to interact with the sermon and really go deeper with what we're studying today. So we're in 2 Thessalonians. We've been in a series called Upside Down, in which we're studying through Paul's first and second letters to Thessalonians. And after several weeks of being in these two letters, we have now come, this will be our last study in this, and as you saw in the video, next week we're starting a new study in the first and second letters of Peter. So you're not going to want to miss that. But this morning, 2 Thessalonians, and let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, Lord, that is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it cuts right to the heart of us, Lord, to the, ma- to the heart of the matter when it comes to us. Lord, thank you that uh, through your word, you open us up, you diagnose us, and you do surgery on us to make us well. And Lord, we pray that you would do that this morning, that your word would speak into our lives, Lord, and that we would be receptive to it. And so, Lord, we, we pray that as we come to your word today, Lord, that we would hear it as your word from God to us, But Lord, let us also receive it and put these things into practice. Let us respond to your word appropriately, we pray, as we hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the title of today's message is, Mind Your Business. So here's what I need you to do. Just turn to the person next to you, and I want you to tell them out loud, go for it. We're going to say, Mind Your Business, okay? Go for it. Mind Your Business. All right, now I want you to say it one more time, but this time I want you to say it again out loud, but I want you to say it to yourself. Mind your, mind your business. You're never as sassy when you say it to yourself, right? Like the first time you're like, mind your business. And then you're like, all right, mind my business. Okay. Okay. So um, did you know, I, I, had a, uh, I had a coin collection when I was a kid. My dad worked for many years at the Denver Mint. So yes, he made money for a living, right? And so uh, some of you got that. All right. So, um, you know, I had a coin collection. So I learned a lot about coins. Interesting thing about coins. Maybe you didn't know this. The very first penny in the United States history, was only in circulation for one year, the very first one, and it was designed by Benjamin Franklin. And it had um, the words on it, mind your business. It was on the very first penny, mind your business. And it also had on it a picture of the sun and a sundial, and it had the Latin word fugio, which means I fly, I fly. And the idea behind this penny was just this. He was saying, time flies, right? Uh, Daylight is fleeting. Therefore, mind your business. Mind your business. That phrase, by the way, mind your business. Did you know that Benjamin Franklin, you know where he got that phrase? Uh, He got it from the Bible. He got it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, where Paul told the Thessalonians, mind your business. Mind your business. Now, why did Paul say that to the Thessalonians? Were they particularly nosy people? Were they, you know, butting into other people's business and meddling in Paul's personal affairs? Well, no. So this is one of those cases in which uh, the same English word or the same English phrase can have different meanings at different times in different uh, countries, like in Britain and the United States, right? So we have a lot of British friends, and what you realize after, you know, talking to them is that sometimes you'll be saying words that you both understand, but they mean different things to each of you. For example, did you know that in Britain, a lot of men carry purses? They just do. They, all these dudes carry in purses. Why? Because, well, what we call a purse, they call a handbag, and what we call a wallet, many of them call a purse. So you got all these men in Britain carrying around purses like a bunch of sissies, right? So uh, the, other, the other one, right, there's another example, is that uh, to be mad in America means that you're angry, right? I'm so mad. But in England, to be mad means that you're crazy. And so if you tell your British friends, I'm so mad, just be careful because they might 
agree with you, right? Because they might think that you are admitting that you are crazy. So all over England, here's another example. They have these signs that say, mind your head, mind your step. And of course, on the London Underground, the tube, there's the announcer who says famously, mind the gap. Okay, why? Because that word mind, to mind something in Britain, uh, means to pay careful attention to something. And so when Paul tells us, mind your business, when Benjamin Franklin put mind your business on the very first penny, what they were saying was not butt out of other people's business. What they were saying was pay careful attention, diligent attention to your business, whatever your business might be. And the overarching theme of this final chapter of 2 Thessalonians is business, your business, God's business, other people's business. We're all up in that business. And so what Paul has to say about work here in the final chapter of 2 Thessalonians can be summed up in two headings. And that's how we're going to look at this. Two headings. Number one, Jesus made your business his business. That's the essence of the gospel. Jesus made your business his business. Therefore, you and I ought to make God's business our business. And we should mind our business. Okay, so in addition to, uh, just a, some setting for you, okay? In addition to persecution, in addition to false teaching, which we've seen in the first two chapters, that these were the problems that Thessalonian Christians were dealing with, persecution, false teaching. There was a third problem that they were dealing with as well, and that was there were some troublesome people in the church, some people who were not uh, doing what they ought to have been doing, and Paul refers to them with this word. He calls them unruly people. Right? They're like Christians gone wild, right? Like unruly people. And you got to think, wow, that sounds pretty extreme. Like they're unruly. Like what are they doing? Like they sound like college kids on spring break in Florida, right? Like they're unruly. They're doing something they shouldn't do. Well, what was their particular form of unruliness? We're going to see that here in this chapter. Here was their unruliness. Many of them were unwilling to work. They were unwilling to work and they were mooching, they were freeloading off of the generosity of other people in the church. And what made this situation even more confusing and difficult for the Thessalonians, they, they weren't sure what to do. They reached out to Paul and asked him for some help with this. The reason it was so confusing is because one of the reasons that these people gave for not wanting to go to work was because they considered themselves basically too spiritual for work. Too spiritual for work. They, they thought, hey, you know, we're so spiritual. We're seeking God so much that uh, we don't need to go to work. We shouldn't go to work. We don't have to go to work uh, because we're so spiritual and we're seeking God so much. Here in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, Paul dedicates this entire chapter to talking about work. Think about that. That's one-third of this entire level, a letter he dedicates to talking about the issues of work and how work relates to spirituality. Now, I got to tell you guys, this is an extremely relevant issue for every single one of us in here today. Work and spirituality. How does our work relate to our relationship with God? What is there, you know, how do we understand spirituality and work and how do the two go together? You know why this is so relevant for each and every one of us in here today? Well, according to a Gettysburg College study taken just a few years ago, the average American will spend 90,000 hours at work, which is about one third of your life. You're going to spend one third of your life on average at work. Now, in contrast to that, you're going to spend about 1 80th of your life with your friends, okay? So 1 80th of your life will be spent hanging out with your friends compared to one third of your life will be spent at work. And some of you are like, well, now I understand why the Thessalonians quit their jobs and didn't want to work. Maybe I'm going to do the same. Like maybe being unruly is a super good idea, right? Well, before you go and quit your job, let's talk about this. Um, if you spend one third of your life at work, well, that means it works, obviously, a pretty big part of your life. It matters. So what does God have to say about your work? And how does your work relate to your relationship with God? Paul begins this letter, uh, begins this chapter, interestingly, by asking the Thessalonians to pray for his work, right? So this is the whole theme. He says, I want you to pray for my work. That's how I want to start. He says in verses 1 and 2, Finally, brothers, Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may, we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. So Paul's first and primary prayer request 
is this, that the word of God would speed ahead, right? That it would go forth unhindered, that it would spread to many people, and that it would be received by the people that it came to. See, Paul understood that what people need more than anything is not to change their behavior. What people need more than anything is they need a new heart. They need to become new people. See, Paul understood that there's a dynamic, a spiritual dynamic to the word of God, a spiritual power. It has the ability to impact our hearts and our minds. As the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, he says, the word of God is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. He said it cuts right to the heart of the matter. It opens us up like a surgeon's knife and reveals what is going on inside of us and God uses his word to do surgery on us. See, that's why here at Whitefields, you know this, this is what we're about. We're Bible people. That's just who we are as a church. We believe in the power of God's word. We, we want... Uh, to do everything we can to encourage people, you, others outside these walls, to read God's word, to get it into your lives, to understand it so that our lives can be changed through it. The second thing that Paul asked them to pray for in regard to his work is that he would be delivered from evil and wicked men. See, there were people who wanted to hinder the work of the gospel or, or the, the furtherance of the gospel, the spreading of the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but this always strikes me as interesting. See, we read the New Testament, we read the book of Acts, and we read that, you know, the, the missionaries would come into some town, and then it would be like a riot, and like people would try to kill them and murder them and stone them to death, and people would be angry, and there was so much opposition. And I just find that so fascinating, because think about it. Think about it. Like, what were these people going around preaching? Like, why were people so adamantly opposed to this message that Christians were spreading? What was the message itself, right? Like, just imagine some people come to your house, and they say to you, I've got good news. God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And your response is, I need to kill this person, right? Like I need to rid the earth of the scourge of these people who are telling me that God loves me and has a plan for my life. Like I need to start a riot. I need to get this person arrested. We need to rid the earth of this terrible teaching. That's kind of a strange reaction, don't you think, to the message that God loves you and that he has a plan for your life, right? To the message of love and hope and salvation. You're like, God loves you. There's hope. There's salvation in Jesus. It's a free gift. And you're like, I hate this. Why would anyone respond that way? I mean, really, this is the message. God wants to know you. He loves you. And he has acted in Jesus, in history, to remove every barrier that stood between you and him. He's offered you eternal life. He offers you forgiveness of sins, redemption, a new start at life. And this precious gift, this priceless gift is offered to you as a gift, right, for free. And yet, who in their right mind would say no to that? Who in their right mind would say, yeah, uh, no thanks? And yet people do. They do that all the time. Not only do people say no, but sometimes, like we see here, they actually oppose this message. Now, why is that? Well, we can look at Paul the Apostle uh, for some insight into his own life and why he did that in his own life. See, Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3. He talks about the things which, which, cause, which he was worried about when it came to being a Christian. And what it really comes down to with Paul, he says this. He was worried that if he gave his life to Jesus, if he really put his faith and trust and hope in Jesus and, and began following him as a disciple, that he would lose things. There were things from his life that he would have to give up. In his case, it was the uh, prestige that he had in his position as a Jewish leader. But, you know, for many people, this is what holds them back. They're afraid, if I give my life over to God, he is going to take things away from me. I'm going to have to give things up. And therefore, there's this hindrance or sometimes even, you know, a violent pushback against the gospel. And, and again, why? Because people are afraid of what they will have to lose if they give their life over to God. But see, here's what happened with Paul. When he finally surrendered his life to God, he realized that what he gained was so much greater than anything he ever gave up, to the point where it was laughable to even compare the two, right? He says, at one point, I realized that everything that I was holding on to that was keeping me from giving my life to Jesus, it was all rubbish, garbage, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing him. See, the reason why many people resist or reject the gospel, again, is because there is a cost to being a disciple of Jesus. Do you know that? I mean, I have to be upfront with you. There's a cost. 
To embrace Jesus means giving up your other gods, the other things that you live for and worship. It means admitting that there are areas of your life where you have fallen short and you need a savior. It means surrendering control over your life over to God. Now, committing your life to following Jesus will absolutely turn your world upside down. That's the name of our series, and for good reason, because that was what the Thessalonian people in, in the city were afraid that Christianity would do, and they were right. When the gospel comes into your life, that's what it does. It turns your world upside down. It upends your life. But as Paul the Apostle found, and as so many of us have learned, haven't we, that that is the best thing that can actually ever happen to you. It's not something to fear. It's something to embrace uh, happily. See, some people have this idea that Christianity is primarily about what you have to give up to follow God. Friends, I just want to tell you that's not the case. Christianity isn't primarily about what you have to give up for God. Christianity is about what you gain in Jesus. See, also, it wouldn't be completely honest of me to not tell you this, that God does want to take some things away from you. You know that? There are things that God wants to take away from you. Absolutely. You know what they are? He wants to take away your sense of hopelessness. He wants to take away your sense of aloneness. He wants to take away that sense of shame. He wants to take away from you the feeling that your life has no meaning and purpose and value. He wants to take away those things in your life that are dragging you down and ultimately not helping you, even in long-term destroying you. See, maybe there are some of you today, and there is an area of your life, and of course you know what that is. I don't, but you do. There's an area of your life where you are holding back, right? Where, where you're not surrendering fully your life, full control of your life over to God. Maybe you're afraid of what you'll have to give up, what you might lose if you fully surrender your life over to him and let him be your Lord. And I just want to encourage you that like Paul the Apostle, the same is true for us. The things that we are so afraid of losing or giving up if we wholeheartedly follow Jesus, they are nothing compared to what we stand to gain in him. And so I want to encourage you today, surrender your whole life over to him. Don't hold anything back. You will not regret it. So Paul begins this section about work and minding your business by asking them to pray for his work. But then, starting in verse 3, Paul shifts and he begins giving some words of encouragement. Here's what he says. He says, But the Lord is faithful, and he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So notice Paul transitions here from talking about his work to talking about God's work in our lives. And he continues that for the next two verses. He says in verse 4, We have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things we command. And he says, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. So everything he's saying here is about God's work in our lives. He ended verse 2 by saying this, Not all people have faith. And then right there in verse 3, he says, not all people have faith, but what's the contrast? Look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. So let me just read those verses to you together so you get that juxtaposition, that contrast there. He says, pray that we might be delivered from evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful, and he will guard you against the evil one. You see that juxtaposition? You see the contrast there between faith and faithfulness, between evil and evil on the other hand, right? So in other words, people are unfaithful, but God is faithful. People lack faith, but God is faithful. There is evil in this world, and yet God, he says, will protect you from the evil one. There's evil in this world, and you know what's even worse than that? It's not just that evil is somewhere out there. It's not just that evil exists in some particularly bad people somewhere out there. Here's the deal with evil that the Bible tells us, that evil is even bound up within our very hearts. Each and every one of us, right? There's, there, it's bound up within us. In other words, we need to be saved not just from the evil outside in the world. We need to be saved from the evil that is bound up in our hearts. See, by, by the faithful work of God, is that he is faithful even when we are faithless. And Jesus delivers us from evil, even the evil that is bound up in our own hearts. How? By redeeming us, by regenerating us, by making us new people with new hearts. See, Jesus died to deliver us from evil by decisively defeating the evil one through his life, death, 
and resurrection. And because of what he did, we can be delivered, we can have hope. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it tells us this about God. It says, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So this is all about who God is and what God does in our lives. So continuing on this theme of work, notice this. Paul started out by asking for prayer for his work. Then he transitions into talking about God's work in our lives, that God is faithful keeps his promises, that God's work is to establish you. You know, some of the pictures the Bible uses for that is like a tree that has roots that go down deep into the ground. You can think about when the wind picks up, those trees don't blow over, they stand strong. Why? Because they have roots, they're established. You know, another picture the Bible uses is that of a building that has a foundation. And when the winds come and the waves crash against the house, the building, if it has a strong foundation, can stand. And so that's what God does in his life by his spirit is he establishes you. He does that through his word, establishing you in love and faith so that you're prepared when the storms and trials of this life come that you'll be able to stand in the midst of them because you have a foundation, you have roots. Another work of God's uh, in, in our lives in verse four, it says that he enables you to do that which he has called you to do. I love this. See, here's the thing. Most of us already know what we ought to do, right? You don't need a lot of instruction about what you need to do. Most of us have a list of things that we know that we should do, and yet what we struggle with is actually doing those things. And I love this, that when God comes, he says, not only am I going to give you instruction, but I am going to enable you to do the things that I am calling you and asking you to do. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. He says this, Therefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you catch that? He says, you work out your salvation, but it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, God's work in our lives is that he works in us both the will, so the desire, and the ability to do what he has called us to do. Another work of God, verse 5, is this, that God directs our hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Jesus told us that would be the work of the Holy Spirit. He would direct our hearts back to God, back to God. So here's what all this means uh, under our first heading. Jesus made your business his business. Jesus made your business his business. That's the essence of the gospel. That in spite of the fact that we were once people who didn't have faith, despite the fact that evil was bound up within our hearts, even though we were estranged from God, God didn't just throw up his hands and say, well, that's your problem, not my problem. He could have easily just washed his hands and said, hey, you guys got yourself into this mess. It's your mess to fix. Leave me out of this. And he would have had every right to do so, but he didn't do that. See, that's the good news of the gospel, that God made your business his business. He got involved. He intervened on your behalf because he loves you, and he is continually working in your life for good. God made your business his business. That's the heart of the gospel. He acted on your behalf because he loves you. That's why, because he loves you, and he continues to work in your life. Why? Because he loves you. Now, what does that mean for our lives practically? How then should we live because of the gospel? Well, the answer to that is this. As we've been saying, Jesus made your business his business. Therefore, make, your, make God's business your business. Make God's business your business. Let me put it this way. The essence of the Christian life is working out what God has worked in you by what Jesus did for you working out what God has worked in you by what Jesus did for you. I want to remind you of this verse, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. It says this, Therefore, my beloved, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Such an interesting verse, right? Because you're like, wait, how's this work again? Check it out. He says, God works in and we work out. Right? God works in and we work out. So God puts inside of you. He does his work inside of you. And then what you do is you put into practice what he has already worked inside of you. Those things that he has worked inside of you, you get to work them out and live them out and exercise them and put them into practice. The essence of the Christian life 
is working out that which God has worked in you by what Jesus did for you. So Jesus made your business his business. Now what does that mean for us? It means this. Therefore, the only right response is what? To make God's business your business. To make God's business your business. Here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul the Apostle, he says, there is a group of people whom the Thessalonian Christians should keep away from. Now that's intriguing. Maybe there were some of you when you were in high school or when you were a younger, right? There were a group of people who your parents told you to keep away from those people, right? Who were they? I don't know, drug dealers, uh, cult members, bad influences. They were like, keep away from those people. So who are the people that Paul says that these Thessalonian Christians should have nothing to do with? Keep away from these people. Are, are they murderers? Are they thieves? Are they heretics? That's what we might expect. But guess what? Paul says, no, don't have anything to do with people who are lazy. So what's Paul's deal? Like, does he just have a problem with lazy people? Like, is he just a you know, workaholic and he's like all down on people who like to chill? Like, what's his issue, right? It's interesting, you know, there's an ancient list of, of seven particularly bad sins that was created by the early church, right? And so there are seven sins. which the early church called the seven deadly sins. And they said, these are the things which are particularly dangerous to your soul. They're particularly dangerous in the church and in society. They included things like greed and envy. And you know what else they included? Sloth, which is not just a cute animal. It is that too, but it is, uh, it is an old word for laziness, right? So laziness makes the top not just the top 10 deadly sins, right? The top 10 list. No, it makes the top seven most deadly sins. Laziness. That's interesting, right? So look at what Paul says in verse six. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition you received from us. And when Paul talks here about tradition that they received, he's not just talking about like traditions in general. He's not talking about church traditions in general. Specifically, he's talking about one tradition, which is clear from what he says afterwards. The tradition that he and Silas and Timothy, this missionary team who went to Thessalonica, the tradition that they gave them of what? Of working hard. That's the tradition he's talking about. See, we know this because of what he says next in verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked day and night that we might not be a burden to you. It was not because we did not have the right, but in order to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So we know that during Paul's missionary journeys, a lot of the time, he worked as a tent maker. It's kind of a, you know, in our day and age, we would call that, you know, that's in the construction sector, right? He, it's a blue-collar job. And what he's saying here is this. He goes, you know why we worked in that job when we, when we lived in your town? It's not because we had to. We didn't really have to. I mean, we, we probably could have made other, you know, arrangements and lived off of other money. No, we didn't do it because we had to. We did it because we wanted to give you an example to follow. Now, why would he want to do that? Why is this so important? Well, there are a couple reasons. Let me, let me run you through them. First of all, he states here and in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talks about how it was important to him that whenever he went into a town as a missionary and started a church, that no one would be able to accuse him of, you know, converting people to Christianity in order to get money out of them. So he refused to take money from anybody just so it would never be a hang-up or something that anyone could ever accuse him of. Right? Here's another reason. He wanted to give them an example to follow. Why? Because, see, most of the people in any given church are not in what we call nowadays full-time ministry. Most of the people in a church are not on the church staff. And so what Paul wanted to teach them by example was what it looks like to work a full-time job and be a Christian. The, the other reason this was important was because Paul wanted to teach them an example of how radically different Christians think about work than most other people in the world. Christians have a specific and unique work ethic. Now remember that these people were Greeks. They lived in Greece. And as people who lived in Greece, they came to Jesus with a lot of cultural baggage, as we all do. Now their particular cultural baggage had something to do with work, as is probably the case for many of us. 
Here, here's what it was for them. According to Greek mythology, the reason the gods on Mount Olympus created the, the humans, they created them to be their slaves, right? Because the gods wanted to hang out and be irresponsible and like have nonstop parties and they're always falling in love with each other and, and basically, you know, acting irresponsible. And so the gods created the humans to take care of the world so that they could be free to be irresponsible and not have to think about things. And what this led to was the view that work was bad, that work was a curse, that work was to be avoided if you can avoid it, and that to be truly spiritual, to be like the gods, is to not work. And so for the Greeks, you know, not all work was considered equal either. They looked down very much on people who did manual labor, blue-collar work, and they elevated white-collar work, intellectual work, as being of greater dignity, uh, a greater value than physical work. And the ultimate goal of life for a Greek person was to get other people to work for you so that you wouldn't have to work and you could live like a god and not have to ever work again. So you can imagine how radically different it would have been for these people to see Paul, a scholar, a trained man, right, like university education and a spiritual leader at the same time to be out there on the construction site with them, building tents alongside them. Especially considering the fact, like Paul says here, they didn't need the money. He wasn't out there because he needed the money. That isn't why he worked, right? It must have blown their minds. Like, who works if they don't need to work? It was completely outside of their paradigm, outside of the box of how they thought about work. Now, we as Christians, where do we get our work ethic from? Well, it comes straight out of the Bible. Think about how the Bible begins. It begins with God working doesn't it? Right? So God is working. He's creating the world, and he's creating it not out of a, you know, begrudging, like, oh, I got to get through these first six days so I can have that day of rest because I can't wait to rest. No. It says that God, as he creates the world, he delights in the work that he's doing. He creates something, and he looks at it and says, yeah, that's good, and he enjoys it, right? And so he creates something, and he finds pleasure in his work. And then it comes to the creation of human beings, which the Bible says this is the pinnacle of God's creation. Whereas everything else God made, he created by speaking it into existence. When it comes to humanity, what does God do? He gets his hands dirty, doesn't he? He puts his hands in the dirt. He forms us out of the dirt, the dust of the earth. You get this picture of God grabbing a chunk of ground and just molding it like Play-Doh. And then what does he do? He puts his lips to our lips and breathes his life into us. It's a beautiful, moving picture of what work is and what God does. And again, God says, this is the pinnacle of my creation, this thing I created with my hands out of the dirt, breathe my life into it. More beautiful than the Grand Canyon, more glorious than the Rocky Mountains is us. See, how did God create us? With his two hands out of the dust of the earth, manual labor. He got dirt under his fingernails, blue collar work. And then it says this in Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work, to work and to keep the garden. And notice this, this all happens before sin comes into the world. In other words, work is not a curse. Work is part of our design, our good design from God. It's part of how we are made in the image of God, right? And in paradise, there was work. In other words, the Bible sees work, views work as something which is good. It's part of the way that we're created in God's image. It's part of our design. Studies have shown that idleness, right, idleness leads to higher rates of depression illness, and even death. So in other words, you need, you literally need to work in order to survive, in order to be happy. Obviously, we can overwork, and obviously not all jobs are equally fulfilling, are they? But Paul wants us to understand this, that according to the Bible, work is not a curse. It's not something to be avoided. It is a good thing to be celebrated. And Paul wanted to model this revolutionary view of work to the Thessalonians when he was with them, and that's why he worked a job. See, when sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3, it tells us that the result of that wasn't that work suddenly had to happen. No, work existed before that. What happened when sin came into the world, it uses a different word now. It uses a word, introduces a word, toil, toil, right, which is working and sweating and frustration, 
So frustration, this aspect of frustration was added to our work because we live in an imperfect world where things don't work right. We work with imperfect people who don't do what is right all the time. And so there's this element after sin comes into the world, not that work suddenly comes as a curse, no, but that there's an added level of frustration and toil in a world that's incongruent. And so, you know, people ask sometimes, what will heaven be like? Right? And, and I had somebody um, on the radio call-in show the other day, and they said, uh, I'm really anxious about going to heaven because it seems like it's going to be super boring. And I was like, you're anxious about going to heaven? Like, that's worrying me, first of all. Secondly, um, I don't think that heaven's going to be like just sitting around doing nothing forever. Because I got to tell you, that sounds miserable. Like, imagine waiting in the DMV for like... Eternity, that's really what people think. It's like heaven. Okay, well, I guess, you know, I'm not sick anymore, but I have to sit here forever, right? Uh, No, I got to tell you this. It says in Revelation that those around the throne serve. And what is serving? That's work, okay? So I want to tell you this. I believe that there's work in heaven. And I think that's a good thing because sitting around for all of eternity sounds miserable. And so Paul says to the Thessalonians, these people in your church who are refusing to work, who are mooching, freeloading, keep away from these people. Look what he says in verse 10. Even when we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, do not let him eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. So there were people in the Thessalonian church who thought, They didn't need to work. They were exempt from it. Other people in the church should be responsible to take care of them. Now, let me be clear. We've got a lot of caveats here, and I I do believe I need to say them all just to clear it all up. We are not talking about people who are disabled and can't work. We're not talking about people who are injured, disabled, people who are elderly. We, We know that Christians then and now gladly take care of these people. We see it as our duty to do so. Paul is talking here about able-bodied people who chose not to work. This also, by the way, doesn't mean that we as Christians should not show kindness to people who have uh, maybe gotten themselves into a predicament because of their own bad decisions. This does not exempt us from showing kindness. We still show kindness to people even if they got themselves in their predicament. You know why? Because that is how God has acted towards us. We got ourselves in a mess and he has shown us kindness. This is speaking of people who, were, who had a habit of freeloading and mooching off of others, not contributing, not even contributing to themselves, right? Now, why were they doing this? So it's possible that this was just an influence of their culture. Right, Greek culture was like working is for losers, and so I'm not going to work because I, if I don't have to. But there's another possibility, like we looked at chapter two last week, that there was this fear in the Thessalonian church that Jesus had returned, and basically he was like in the town down the street, and he's going to be here soon, and he's going to take us out of here. And so, what did these people do? They're like, if Jesus came back, like we've got like you know a couple days left here on earth. I'm calling into work. Like, I'm quitting my job. I'm not going into work. No more nine to five for me. I'm going to enjoy these last couple days I got before Jesus takes me home. And, uh, and so that's what they did. The only problem was Jesus hadn't returned. And pretty soon, because they didn't have jobs anymore, they also didn't have any money. And now they're living off the generosity of other people in the church. And Paul says, that's not okay. That's slothfulness. That's a sin. That's not the way we taught you. That's not what we modeled for you. We taught you that it's good to work and make a living. So instead of working at jobs, these people were just hanging out. And as a result, it says they became busybodies. They weren't busy at work, so they were busy meddling in other people's business. And Paul encourages the Thessalonians there at the end. He says to enact what we call church discipline, right? Church discipline on these people. Not to be vindictive, not to stick it to them. No, it was a way to help them realize the error of their ways and to help them to stop doing what they were doing, at which time they would be welcomed back into the fellowship. Now, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he refers to these people as unruly people, The word they use there refers to a person, literally, who doesn't show up for work. It refers to a soldier who isn't at his post when he's supposed to be at his post. It speaks of somebody who has something to do, but they're not doing it. They're absent from where they're supposed to be. And what Paul told the Thessalonians, he told them, 
admonish these people, rebuke them, right? I mean, basically kindly, gently, lovingly rebuke them, address that behavior, and set it right. And so I just want to do that. I want to ask you right now, I wonder if there are any of you here today. I want you to just take this question to heart. Are there any of you who are unruly in that way? And as kindly and as gently and as lovingly as I possibly can, let me ask you, are you absent from some area where you need to be engaged, right? Is there a ministry that you, you need to be a part of? Is there a community group that you need to be attending? See, it's really easy to show up and kind of stay on the periphery and not really get engaged. But here's the deal. We want you to grow. We want you to grow. You have gifts and abilities to contribute to the body and others will benefit and you will benefit from them. You will grow as a result of serving and as a result of connecting with others. So I want to encourage you, if you are one of these unruly people, and you'll know if you are, right? To, I want to encourage you to get involved. We have a place for you. And what you will find is that as you serve, as you connect, you will grow. So Paul's admonition to us here in this letter is this. Mind your business. He says in verse 13, don't grow weary in doing good. And that brings up the question, what is your business? What is your business? Now, I hope that you're asking that question of God right now where you're sitting. What is my business? God, what are the things that you've called me and entrusted me and asked me to do? What is my business and how can I best mind that business? If you're a mom or a dad, your business is those kids. Love them, raise them up in God's ways, lead them to Jesus. If you're involved in some ministry here at church, that's your business. Mind it carefully, mind it well. Pay careful attention to it because it matters. Everything that we do here, every aspect of this ministry matters to this work of the word of God transforming people's lives and getting out there. So sometimes people get really hung up on this idea of calling, right? You can even get paralyzed like, Oh no, like what's God's calling for my life? What if I missed it? Or what if I, you know, God, how are you going to reveal it to me? What, what if I mess it up, right? And they get paralyzed wondering what's God's calling? I'm not sure. And sometimes they won't do anything because they don't know what God's calling is. Well, the reformers in the 16th century had a really interesting way of thinking about this. They said this, they used the word vocation. Now, nowadays, we use the vocation, word vocation to just mean work, right? Like we talk about vocational schools and things like that. It just means training for jobs. But when the reformers used that word, it meant something else. See, vocation comes from the Latin word for calling, vocare. And, they, and, and what that expressed was that as Christians, these early Protestant Christians would say this. They would say, when I work, I don't just view my job, whatever it is, right? If I'm a builder, if I'm a teacher, that's not just my job. That's my calling from God to honor him and to love my neighbor in practical ways, right? The two great commandments, love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love God with your strength? How do you love your neighbor in practical ways? By doing the job as a calling that God has given to you. In other words, you can do your work as an act of worship and as a loving service to other people. You know, Martin Luther, he, he said this, that we, Jesus taught us to pray. He said, give us this day our daily bread. And he said, think about that. In order for God to answer that prayer, the way that God answers that prayer includes a farmer, a miller, a baker, a grocer, and a whole bunch of other people in between. And as they do their jobs every day, they're not just doing their jobs to make a paycheck. They're doing the work of God to answer that prayer every single day for people around the world. In other words, you can do your job as a service to God and as a service to other people. So that brings us to the question, how can I best honor God and love my neighbor through my work? What is your business? There are things that God has called you to do. There are ways for you to serve others. There is work to be done. There are ways for you to contribute to the work of God in the gospel, in the church, and in your job. Let me encourage you, mind your business, whatever your business is. The essence of the Christian life is working out what God has worked in you by what Jesus did for you. The message of the gospel is that Jesus made your business his business. Therefore, the only proper response is for us to make God's business our business. And let us be those who mind our business. Let me finish up by this. It says this in verse 17. Uh, he finishes with a benediction. We'll read that at the close of our service. But in verse 17, Paul says, 
I, Paul, write this greeting to you with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter. It is the way I write. See, people, as we know from chapter two, had written fake letters purporting to be from Paul, but they really weren't from Paul. They were just trying to pass it off, like, hey, here's from Paul, and they're trying to teach whatever crazy, wacky doctrine they had. And Paul says, no, here's how you'll know it's from me. He takes the pen. You know, he's been writing probably through a scribe, so the whole thing is in one handwriting. Now Paul takes the pen, and it's in a different handwriting, if you would have seen that original letter and Paul says this is how you know it's from me that you know it's original and he finishes with these words the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you it's God's grace that saves us it's God's grace that sustains us and it's God's grace that empowers us to mind the business that God has entrusted to us may we do that by his grace amen please stand with me and let's pray Lord thank you for this great truth of the gospel, that you made our business your business. Lord, may we be those who make your business our business. Lord, help us to understand what is the business that you have given us, that you've called us to, and help us to mind it in a way that we pay diligent attention to it and we do it to your glory uh, and for the benefit of our neighbor. Lord, help us to love people by the way that we mind our business. Help us to honor you and worship you by the way that we mind our business. And may we do that by your grace, by your strength in us. In Jesus' name, amen.